is in the precious and glorious name of Jesus we pray that every heart and mind say amen. Amen. amen amen and amen as you return back to your seats we ask that you will be seated in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ we ask that you will lift up your voices and sing with us Father I my hands to thee no I want to just ask today as we go through this period of Lent as we surrender our will to the will of God to the word of God by the way of God that during this Lent season that we will examine our preparation we will examine where we are in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That we will look at asking the Holy Spirit to help us to deny ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ. Lent is that time 40 days prior to Easter that we do self-examination, we do self-denial, but we also, we are praying and we're preparing, we're communing with God. That we will truly come to realize where we are in our relationship. Where we are in terms of our commitment, our dedication, our devotion to God. to Not only God, but also to his church. This is the body of Christ. So as we go through this Lent season, we challenge you, we encourage you to do self-evaluation. And through the messages up until Easter they're designed and we pray the Holy Spirit will use them to provoke our thinking not just intellectually but spiritually but also it will challenge us as we profess to be the Christian that we say we are and we pray that we will grow and we will mature in the will and the way and the word of God and as we say, Father, I stretch my hand to thee, no other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, oh, whether shall I go? It's in that spirit of surrender that we ask that you will prepare your hearts and your minds to hear our choir. And then be prepared to hear what thus saith the Lord.
Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. The angels in heaven have signed my name. Lord, I know I did you. Thank you, choir, for reminding us of that wonderful, wonderful song. We want to ask if you would please go with us to Matthew chapter number 7. As I stated that we're in this period of Lent, 40 days, not counting Sunday, as we travel with Jesus as he traveled back then, as he traveled to Calvary. And we want to challenge us to really give thought to what Jesus desires of us as Christians, I want to go to Matthew chapter 7. I want to begin our reading at verse number 24. Verse number 24. Matthew chapter 7. Starting with verse number 24. Matthew is recording Jesus in this text. And listen at what Jesus says. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. Here's what he says in verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built on his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it failed, and great was the fall of it. Amen. And I want to use as a sermon title, based upon the sermon text, verses 24 through 27, are you wise or foolish. In this Lent season, the question that I want to raise this morning to those who are listening in the radio listening audience and to those who are seated here in the sanctuary, are you wise or foolish? Listen again to what Jesus says. Everyone, therefore, who hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Then he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the floods came, 
and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. It happened when Jesus had finished saying these things. And you may ask me, Reverend Flakes, what was Jesus referring to when he was talking about these things? These words of mine. Well, you have to really start at chapter number five of Matthew. Because Jesus, as many scholars believe, Matthew chapter 5, verse going through verse, chapter 7, this is called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus was talking about these sayings in terms of the kingdom of God. He had talked about these sayings of mine, the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You, you can just go down and read the Beatitudes, but he also says, Blessed are you when others revile, when others insult you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. He's talking about these sayings of mine. He's talked them about being the salt and light of the earth. Talked about Christ came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. He talked about, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to hell. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and these and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first to be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. These sayings of mine. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. He talks about these sayings, judging others, a tree that there's good fruit, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, the golden rule. It happened when Jesus had finished saying these things. And then he concludes the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain. He concludes with verses 24 through 27. He tells the story to drive the points home of two builders. One built on a rock. One built on sand. And I just want to come by to challenge us and to ask us, are we the wise person? Or are we the foolish person? And how does building your life on Jesus' word protect you when the storms of life come? Both heard the word. Both built.
build a house. So I just want to just contemporize this just for a moment so that we can basically make sure that we are understanding what Jesus was really saying in this parable. What he was teaching and what he was really trying to expose to those who were hearing his instructions. So let me just go ahead and just ask you to do this for me just for a minute. Are y'all up? Are y'all trans neurotransmitters firing right now? So let's just see. How does building your life on Jesus' word protect you when the storms of life come? So I want you to just stop and think about the house that you live in. The place that you dwell in. And if you were asked to describe your house, most likely you would tell about what? The location, the color, the design, the square footage, the size of the lot, and the number of bedrooms, but you probably wouldn't tell about the foundation. Perhaps you don't know anything about your foundation. Yet, my brothers and sisters, it is the foundation of your house that makes all the difference in the world. You ought to read what the wise person said, Solomon in Proverbs 24, verse 3. Listen to what Solomon says. He says, by wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. This is true not only of your house, but it's also true of your life. So in Matthew chapter 24, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus tells a parable that compares and contrasts two builders, one wise and one foolish. He emphasizes how critical it is to have a strong foundation. The use of a building metaphor should not surprise us at all. Why shouldn't it surprise us that Jesus would use building a house as a metaphor? Well, let me just go ahead and answer that because Jesus was a carpenter. I believe Jesus knew some things about building houses because his his stepdaddy, if you're, uh, he, he was a carpenter, Joseph. And I believe that Jesus learned some things about building houses. He learned some things about building furniture. So it's not surprising that Jesus would use building a house as a metaphor because Jesus knew about building some houses. He used the common language. He used the common knowledge. He used examples of the time in which he was in. But however, this story is not just for architects. This story is not just for carpenters. This story is just not just for contractors. This story is for us today. It still have relevance. If we would listen to it. Building a house is simply an analogy for building a life. The house represented life. The point is this, and if you don't get anything else this morning, don't miss this point. We are building a life, and the foundation we choose is the most important feature of our life. Y'all want to get that? Did y'all get that? Yeah. We are building a life and the foundation we choose is the most important feature of life. 
Don't miss that point. So in the verses that we've read in chapter 7 of Matthew, verses 24 through 27, if you notice in the story, in the illustration, Jesus provides two options for building our life. Two options. Remember, I asked the question as the sermon title, are you wise or are you foolish? That is the examining question for the morning. So there are two options. So are you ready for option number one? Here's option number one. Build your life on the strong foundation. It, you will find it right there in verses 24 and 25 of Matthew, the seventh chapter. That's what Jesus was saying. Build your life on the strong foundation. Listen again what Jesus says. Jesus says the only way to build a strong foundation is by what? Obeying his words. Don't miss that. The only way to build a strong foundation is by obeying the instructions and the words of Jesus. He began his parable in chapter number 7, verse 24. I hope you have the Bibles. You can see it right there. With the word, therefore. Well, Pastor, what, what are you saying? What was he saying then? Therefore, takes us back. That's where I started when he says, these sayings of mine. And I say, you have to go back in chapter number five of Matthew and work your way up to chapter number seven. All right. He was saying, therefore, which looks back to the entire Sermon on the Mount. Every Christian ought to know the Sermon on the Mount. Because basically what Jesus was setting is the ethics of the kingdom. He was saying in order to enter into the kingdom, of, if you're in the kingdom, these are the attitudes, these are the instructions that those who truly are in the kingdom will follow. It's not about ought to follow, should follow, may follow, might follow. No, will follow. If you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you're empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's saying you have been born into the kingdom and you've been born into the body of Christ. Are you the wise or are you the foolish? In light of his teachings, Jesus says, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to what? A wise man who built his house on the rock. That's what Jesus says. So by using the word everyone in verse 26, Jesus reveals that his words are intended for all people and for all time. It was not just for then, but it's for now, right now. He begins by stating that you must hear his words in order to do so we must be available to the conviction of the Holy Spirit with the truth what is the truth Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except they come through me so Jesus is the truth Jesus is God in flesh Jesus is the word he is the logos He's the word that had become flesh. And he's saying you must hear my word. How, do we, how, do we, how, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word of God. Yeah. He says that his words are intended for all people for all time. We have to be available to hear his word. This can be done by hearing the preached word. How can they hear without a preacher? How can he preach unless he's been, been sent? But how can they hear without a preacher? He didn't say how.
how can they hear without a choir? He didn't say that. He didn't say how can they hear without a soloist. No, he said how can they hear without a preacher? And how can he preach unless he's been sent? This can be done also by reading the word of God. Spending time in his word. Knowing what the word of God says. But also by prayer. Communing and talking with God. That's why I say this Lent season is a time that we set aside 40 days without counting Sunday. As we prepare going to the cross as Jesus went during that passion week that we examine allow the Holy Spirit to examine us to convict us and even if there needs to be conversion is there anybody in this house yeah. to deny ourselves Lynn allows us that period as we Travel with Jesus to the cross. But not only through prayer, but also by attending worship. And let me just go ahead and parenthetically just say this. Worship has never been about us. Amen. Worship is all about him. And we have to allow the Holy Spirit to help crystallize what worship is truly all about and who, Christian, who worship is about. And to let us understand that worship does not start at 7245 and does not end at 930. Worship is a lifestyle. We worship on our jobs. We worship in the community. We worship in our family. We worship. Worship is a lifestyle. It's 24-7. But some reason, some people have put a time limit on worship. Worship is to glorify and magnify God. To thank him for all that he has done. All that he is doing and all that he will do. And it's by studying the word. Study to show thyself approve. A workman need not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly allowing the Holy Spirit to cut it straight. Is there anybody in this house? Not to pervert it. Not to change it, not to twist it, but to, 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 to rightly divide the word of truth. And the only way that that can be done is that we must be. We've got to be born again because the word is life. Spiritual life. It's spiritual food. And if one is not connected with the vine, then one will never be able to understand the word. And not only do we study the word, but we have a desire to study with other believers in Jesus the Christ. That's why church school is so important. Is that I'm talking about, Jesus talking about building on a solid foundation. Studying with other believers. Because we're all at different places in our journey. Yeah. Some are more mature than others. Some are immature. Is there anybody in this house? Yeah. And, 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 and it's good to be in the fellowship. Yes, it's good to be able to go to the nursery. It's good to be able to, to not only feed the, the drink of the milk. Is there anybody in this house? But then you come to Bible study where you can begin to look and you can begin to be challenged with meat. Is there anybody here? Because God does not want you to continue to just be on milk. Not when you're on a solid foundation. He says, these things, these things of mine. He says, when a person builds on the rock, he likens the person to a wise person. You know, my brothers and sisters, the option number one is to build on a solid foundation. Jesus urges us to hear his words, but here's the second portion of that 
particular scripture in, in, in verse 24 and 25. He not only encourages and commands that we hear it, but he also says, do it. See, we can come to the Lord's house and worship. We can come to Bible study. We can come to church school. But if we don't do it, is there anybody in this house? James says it in chapter 1, verse 22. He says, don't just be hearers of the word, but be also what? Doers of the word, unless you be deceived. Is there anybody in this house? And I'm just afraid that there are so many people who come in and out of the worship. They come in and out of church school. They come in and out of Bible study. And nothing changed. Yeah. All right. Or be yet not deceived. He goes on to say that you must act upon his word. I'm talking about building on a solid foundation. That's the option. That's option number one. And if you are going to build on a solid foundation, you must actually, by way of the Holy Spirit, because we can't do it on our own, do what Jesus instructs you to do. Now, let me just go ahead and say this in John chapter 14, verse 15. This is not, you, you know what Nike, Nike brand is as it relates to Nike when it talks about the Nike shoes? What, what's Nike's brand? Just do it. Nike didn't come up with that on its own. You know who came up with it? Jesus. Read in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Can I just go ahead and translate it in terms of temporary hearing? He says, since you love me, just do it. Since you love me. It, there's not a question mark behind that statement. It's a period. It's not questioning whether you love him or not. He says, since you love me, then do it. And we cannot do it on our own. We must have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's why he says you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Is there anybody in this house? And you will be witnesses up to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Is there anybody in this house? And that's why he says in John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35, he says, a new commandment I give unto you that you what? Do it. Love ye one another as I have loved you. And by this, the whole world will know that you are my disciples. There's no question because my disciples are built on a solid foundation. When they hear the word, listen to the word, then they act upon the word by faith because they're building on a solid foundation the rock Jesus you remember in Matthew 16 when, when Peter when Jesus asked the question who they say that I am and Peter came up and he says you are the Christ the son of the living God and Jesus says now let me just go ahead and help you understand this Peter flesh and blood did not reveal that to you but my father in heaven revealed that to you and he says upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it in other words what he was saying he was saying this is not the Peter I'm going to build this on but the truth that you have just been revealed to by my father from heaven he says that I am the son of God I am the Messiah the sent one it's upon this truth I am the way I am the truth I am the life and he goes on to say over in John 8 he says the truth shall set you free that's verse 32 and then he says in verse 36 if the son of man sets you free you are free indeed are you the wise or are you the foolish then he says in this story that he's concluding the sermon on the mount option on the number one he says I want you to build on a strong foundation and those who hear, those who listen, those who act upon my word, those who do it, then you are likened unto a wise person. But here's option number two. It just blessed my soul. It did. Because both persons heard the same word. Both persons built a house. Both persons 
persons possibly, probably use the same material. But listen to what option number two says. It says, destroy our life on the wrong foundation. That's option number two. Destroy our life on the wrong foundation. When you are when you are building a life, you have two options. To build it on a solid, on a strong foundation, or destroy it building on the wrong foundation. Listen to what Jesus says in chapter number 7, verse 26 through 27. He says, Jesus modifies his previous parable and applies it negatively to those who refuse to obey his words. Operative word there. Refuse. <laughs> In chapter number 7, verse 26, listen to what he says. He says, everyone who hears these words, what were these words? You have to go back to what chapters? Chapter 5, chapter 6, and then chapter 7, and read up to the conclusion of his Sermon on the Mount. That's what he's referencing. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Now, the Greek word for foolish is moros. M O R O S. Moros. Some say morose. But let me just go ahead and translate it for you. I'm not saying this. I'm just trying to help us understand what Jesus was saying to the multitude when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount and he concludes with this illustration. So he could drive his point home. Is there anybody? But also expose those who felt that, those religious leaders, those Pharisees, to expose those who thought that they were truly the ones that was doing God's will. He wanted to expose them. He uses this illustration. A person who disregards Jesus' words is called I'm not calling nobody. I don't want nobody on the radio. I don't want nobody on TV. I don't want nobody on streaming. I don't want nobody in this sanctuary to go away saying, listen to Reverend Flakes, call me this. I'm not, I'm just going ahead and rightly dividing the word of truth. I said the Greek for foolish is moros. And it says that a person who disregards Jesus' words is called a stupid moron. That's what it gets down to. A person who does not and claim and profess that they are Christians, they are followers of Christ and do not do what Jesus has instructed them to do, then he says they are a moros. Don't get upset with me. He didn't build on the rock of Jesus' words. The foolish one. Please note here, the foolish builder also heard Jesus' words, but didn't act upon them. He heard the same words that the person who built on a rock. He built a similar house, same material, but he chose a different foundation. Sand is shifty. Is there anybody in this house? Sand is sandy. Is there anybody here? Sand drifts. Is there anybody? Sand has no real foundation. And whenever you're going to build, you have to put some energy into it. You have to take some time. You have to dig deep. The person
person who was the foolish one did not want to take time to build on a solid foundation. He wanted to do it quick. Every person building a life according to some scheme, some design, people don't build at random. Everyone has a world view or a philosophy. And the question is who or what is your foundation built on? If it isn't Jesus the Christ, then you are building or has built on a sandy foundation. Why did the foolish man build his house on the sand? He miscalculated the weather. You have to get this one. He miscalculated the weather. He thought every day was going to be a sunny day. He, he thought it was going to just be sunshine. He thought his life was always going to be smooth. And that's the way some people who profess that they are Christians and they are not in the word, they're not anchored in the word. They don't come to church school. And just let me just parenthetically say this. It's not just coming to Sunday school, but when you find out what God instructs you to do, then you have to have the desire and a will and you have to pray that the Holy Spirit gives you the strength to follow through with it by faith. Not just hearing it. So he figured a sand dune would do as a foundation. So let's face it, it is appealing to build on the sand. It's found in a good location. It's adequate. It's easy. But who wants to dig down deep if you don't have to? Who wants to come to church school and really study if you don't have to? Who want to come to Bible study when the Super Bowl's on if you don't have to? Who wants to come and, and, and worship during the football and the basketball seasons when you don't have to? And I keep saying to Fourth Street, you got to learn what 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15 says. He says, the reason that we do what we do is for the love of God. It's the love of God that compels. It's the love of God that restraineth, that constraineth. It's the love of God that forces, not in a negative way, but it's the love of God that motivates me to do what I do. Why is that, Reverend Flakes? Because I've come to conclude, I've been persuaded, I've been convinced that he died for us all. Is there anybody in this house? So if anything, if you are doing whatever you are doing in the body of Christ, whatever you are doing in terms of as a professed Christian, if it's not for the love of God, then it's on a sandy foundation he says that the foolish man chose a sandy foundation and he says the one that chose a solid foundation the rain came the wind came and the flood came it didn't say it might rain. It didn't say the floods might come. It didn't say the wind might blow. It said it, the floods came, the rain came, and the wind blew. And that one who had chosen a solid foundation, the house did not fall. But the one who chose to build on his titles the one who chose to build on his money the one who chose to build on his reputation the one who chose to build on world views of independence the world view of self-reliance the world's view of materialism, the world's view of intellectualism, the world's view of relativism, the world's view of politics, 
the world's view. Come on, somebody. Now, he chose to build on a sandy foundation. And when the rains came, when the wind blew, when the floods came, the Bible says that the house fell and it fell great. And I just come by to tell you that when storms come in your life, is there anybody in the house? And storms will come. There may be somebody here, you're in a storm right now. There may be somebody who's coming out of a storm. And I just come by to tell you, don't wait too long because another storm is right around the corner. And if you have built on a solid foundation, then you can basically have the kind of peace that only the solid rock can provide because the solid rock says, my peace I've given unto you, not as the world gives it, but as I've given it unto you. So when the storms of life comes, when the floods of life comes, when the wind of life blows, you can stand boldly like the psalmist says who says I'm planted by the river of water I'm planted with the deep rooted is there anybody in the house who knows what I'm talking about and I'm afraid that there are some professed Christians who believe that they're saved and sanctified but they've built on a sandy foundation and when the storms of life comes when the floods of life comes when the wind of life blows and they're fragile they can't stand they want to give up on God they want to turn their come on somebody against the church they want to go ahead and they'll start saying that the Christianity lied to me Jesus lied to me so they'll convert to something else but I just come by to ask you are you wise or are you foolish? And I just come by to warn you today. Jesus is the solid rock. And that's why we keep singing. Come on, somebody. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock. Is there anybody in the house? On Christ, the solid rock. I stand. Oh, oh the ground is sinking sand. Titles sinking sand. Come on, somebody. Materialism sinking sand. Self-determinism sinking sand. Relativism sinking sand. Is there anybody here? Who knows what I'm talking about? If I'm truly standing on the rock, the rock of Jesus, come on storms, come on floods, come on wind, because I'm anchored in him. I got to leave now. I've got to go ahead and close, but I just want it during this Lent season for us to truly come face to face with our profession. Is our profession really sincere? Is it real? Is it really built on a solid rock? The solid rock is Jesus. Well, Reverend Flakes, how do I build on the solid rock? Well, let me just go ahead and tell you. First of all, you must be. You've got to be born again. You have to accept the solid rock. You must believe. He came down through 42 generations conceived in the womb of a virgin called Mary by the Holy Spirit you must believe he went to a hill called
on Calvary. He gave his hands to the nails. He gave his feet to the nails. And he prayed a prayer. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. The Bible says, he says, if I, if I be lifted up, I'll draw. In other words, what he was really saying, my death will draw all men, all women, boys and girls, unto me. I'll draw. And they lifted him high, stretched him wide. He prayed a prayer. Father, forgive the Roman soldier. Father, forgive Peter who denied me three times. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do, but he forgave the whole wide world. Is there anybody in the house? Forgive the drug addict. Forgive the alcoholic. Forgive the prostitute. Forgive the adulterer. Forgive the fornicator. Forgive them. For they know not what they do. The Bible says, he said it's finished. He is finished. Paid in full. Well, Jesus, what did you finish? I finished paying the penalty for sin. I finished breaking the power of sin. I've conquered death, hell, and the grave. It's finished. The Bible says, he says, into thy hand, I commend my spirit. He locked his head in his shoulder, and he gave up the ghost. He willingly died just for you and I. He willingly shed an innocent blood to atone for our sin, past, present, and future. And then they thought he died. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate, requested his dead body, put it in a bar or tomb. He stayed there all Friday night, stayed there all Saturday and Saturday night. And here's the crescendo. You must believe. Sunday morning, he was raised from the dead with all power, reconciliation power, resurrection power, saving power, all power in his hands. He's a sinner to sit on the right hand of the Father. And one of these old days, he's coming back again. But unto then, are you wise? Or are you the foolish? Are you the moros? Are you acting? Are you living out the instructions that Jesus have left those who are genuinely